Things have come a long way in the miniatures hobby since I first started. When I first started, it was the turn of the millennium, it was the early 2000s, and I started out in my miniatures journey by buying the Lord of the Rings Partwork magazine. Back then, the only way to learn how to build and paint miniatures was to use things like the Partwork magazines or by speaking to people in local stores. Now it's 2022 and I thought I'd put together a quick beginner's guide which will take you from getting your first sprue right up to having your first miniature built and painted. I'll catch you after this. Hi guys, it's Josh at The Pickle Jar and today we are doing Miniature Hobby 101. This is going to be a complete beginner's guide that will take you from having your first sprue, how to build it, all the different tools you'll need, the techniques, all the terms for painting, cover it all. This is going to be designed as a one-stop shop to help beginners and new people getting into the hobby understand what different things mean. There are plenty of YouTube videos out there that show different painting techniques and different styles and different things that you can do. But for a beginner getting into the hobby, all of these terms such as dry brushing, priming, slap chopping, zenithaline, it's a little bit overwhelming. So today we're gonna to take you through the basics, we're gonna take you through everything that you need to know and hopefully get you started on your journey in the miniature painting hobby. As I got started using the Lord of the Rings magazine all those years ago, I thought what better way to demonstrate all of these techniques than by using a Lord of the Rings model that I've had sat on my shelf this year. Before we crack on with that though, let me tell you about this video's sponsor, and that is Anthems of War. Anthems of War is a miniature agnostic fantasy tabletop skirmish war game with a narrative twist. It takes heavy inspiration from the tabletop role-playing games of old and can be played in almost any scale that you want on an area as small as a kitchen table. Anthems of War adds a narrative element to the traditional fantasy war game. Your battles are the stories told by rival bards in a tavern. You not only control your characters fighting on the battlefield, but also take on the role of the bard, embellishing the story to win the crowd to their side. What if that ambush was thrown into disarray by thick mud cut in the field from days of rain prior? By combining unique scenarios, your own cunning and embellishing the story when you feel necessary, no battle will ever be the same. Inside the core rulebook you will find everything you need to get started playing, including the quick starter guide, the rest of the standard rules to introduce more complicated gameplay, instructions for building your own characters to introduce your own creativity into gaming, as well as plenty of scenarios, magic systems and everything else. The Anthems of War core rulebook is available both as a physical book and as a PDF with the links down below in the description. Thanks once again to Anthems of War for sponsoring this video. Now, on with the building. So the first thing that you're going to need to do is to build your miniature. Now for this, you're going to need some clippers, you're going to need some sort of hobby knife or scalpel knife, and you're going to need some glue. There are various different places you can buy these from. Games Workshop sells all of this stuff, but you can also buy it from independent places if you don't want to get the Games Workshop versions. Using a proper pair of clippers to clip your pieces out from the sprue is essential for leaving the model as intact as possible and also leaving as little of the sprue on the model as possible so it's less cleanup to do. Once all the pieces are cut out, there's a couple of things you need to do to clean them up. The first is to go around and remove any excess sprue that is still attached to those pieces. For this, I like to use a hobby knife. Nice sharp blade on that lets you cut through and you can use the back of the knife to scrape over and smooth over any little imperfections that are left from the sprue. The second thing is to get rid of any mold lines that are on there. Now a mold line is where the two parts of the mold are pressed together and it's left a line down the middle of the piece. Again, you can use a hobby knife using either the sharp side or the back side of this to scrape away those mold lines, or you can get dedicated tools which are called mold line removers, funnily enough, and you can use those to scrape them as well. The only difference between that and a knife is that it's not got a sharp edge, so you're less likely to cut yourself with it. Once all your pieces are cleaned up, it's time to stick them together. Now, there are two different types of glue that we generally use in the Miniatures Hobbit. Plastic cement glue and super glue. Now, generally speaking, I use plastic glue for plastic miniatures. What that does is it melts the two parts together, creating a very strong bond. If you're working with metal miniatures, with resin miniatures, 3D prints, anything that isn't plastic, then your best bet is to use super glue. Once again, you don't need to use Games Workshop branded stuff specifically. You can use any old super glue you can pick up from a pound shop, 
Um, it'll do the job for that sort of stuff. For plastic glue though, I would recommend using Tamiya Thin. This stuff is fantastic. It's really thin, so it flows really nice. It's got a brush applicator, so you can be nice and precise with it, and it works really well. Now that your model is fully assembled, we need to get it ready for painting, and to do that, we're going to prime the model. Now, primers come in many different forms. You've got rattle can primers, which is what we're using today. You have airbrush primers, if you're using an airbrush. Don't worry about that for now. You can get brush-on primers, which I personally don't like to use, but a lot of people do, and they are fantastic if that's the sort of way that you want to go, or if you're not able to spray stuff outside. For today, we'll stick with rattle can primers, as they are the most common and the most readily available. Now, again, there are loads of different brands of these that you can get. I prefer using the Colour Forge stuff because I find the finish really nice on them and they have a massive variety of different colours. Now typically you will prime in a black primer but for today I'm priming in a dark blue because I want to try out a couple of different things on this miniature and hopefully show you some new techniques. To prime a miniature using a rattle can, simply take it outside, hold it about 30 centimeters away and dust from side to side with the rattle can, short bursts and spin the miniature as you do so that it gets a nice covering all over. You don't want to hold your can too close to the model because it will overspray onto it and clog up the detail. You also want to make sure that before you spray the rattle can, you've given it a nice shake and in colder weathers, I recommend putting it into a, a bowl of warm water for a couple of minutes just to help the paint start to sort of move around in the can and not clog up and come out all speckly. Now for this miniature, I'm trying something a little bit different. So we are going to skip the base layer because I've used the priming step as my base layer. If you are, however, priming in black and painting up from there, then the base layer just means the first layer of paint that you put down, which is going to be the base color for the different parts of your model. If you are painting in this way, you just want to try and make sure you've got a nice thin coat of paint and nice and even without any brush strokes in there. Depending on the paint that you're using, you might need to thin this down a little bit, which just means adding a little bit of water or medium to the paint to thin it down so it's not quite as thick on the miniature. As I've primed using my base color, however, we are going to jump straight in to adding washers and shades. Now, washers and shades just refer to thinner paint that is generally a little bit translucent, so it's not fully opaque like some of the regular acrylic paints, and it flows a lot better. It's a lot thinner paint. That means that it flows into the recesses, into any crevices and into the details, leaving the tops the original colour or a tinted version of that colour and the darker recesses darker. This is a really easy way to add contrast and to add shadows to your models. For this model, I'm using a black ink from Green Stuff World to add to the blue so that it will create the dark shadows. This ring wraith is supposed to have a black cape, but I hate painting black by just using blacks and greys. I like to use blues to highlight my blacks. By using this technique, what I've essentially done is put down my base layer and my highlight layer, and now I'm adding the shade, which will go into all those recesses and create a nice contrast between the blue at the highest points, transitioning down into black in the recesses. Depending on the kind of look that you're wanting to go for, you might need to put a couple of coats of stuff like this on. If you do so, make sure to wait until the first coat has fully dried before applying the second one. While we're applying that, let me talk about brushes for a moment. Now, there are loads of different brushes out there from super, super expensive ones to nice, cheap and cheerful ones. And generally, I use a mix of the two. For the majority of my work, I use cheap brushes that you can pick up from places like The Works, you can get big bundles of these on Amazon and other places like that. The Baldmere ones are the ones that I would recommend. They are two pound for a pack of four. And I generally pick one of these up every couple of months, use it until it's worn out and then I'll replace it. And I use this for my general layering. I use it for washers, shades, metallics and anything like that. And I reserve my nice fancy uh, sable brushes for when I'm doing very fine detail or very specific work on the final steps of a miniature. If you're brand new and just getting into the hobby, I would recommend picking up some brushes like this so that you're not too worried about damaging or 
messing up your expensive brushes. Main thing to remember with your brushes, regardless of whether you're using sable brushes, which are your expensive ones, or whether you're using your synthetic brushes, which are generally your cheaper ones, is just to not get any paint in the ferrule. The ferrule is the little metal part of the brush that the bristles come out of, and it's what gives them their shape. If you're using a brush that is brand new for the first time, or the first time in a painting session, make sure to wet it before you start putting paint on it as well, so that the bristles are nice and supple. I could go into a whole other video about looking after your brushes and brush maintenance, but for now, I think that's all you need to know. Now, for the purpose of this video, I have put too much black ink onto the model so that hardly any of that blue that I put on as my primer is left showing. Now, I've done this so that I can show you how to use a dry brush. Dry brushing is one of those techniques that most people tend to use when they first start miniature painting, and it is a massively versatile technique to have in your back pocket. All it means is taking a brush of whatever shape you prefer. I prefer using the rounded, softer dry brushes, but there are also these sort of flat ones, which used to be called tank brushes and are now called dry brushes. Taking one of those brushes, putting paint on it, and then wiping the majority of that paint off so you're left with a very small amount, and then simply dusting over the top of the model so that what you're doing is catching all of the raised edges, all of the sharp edges, and applying that paint that is left on your brush to those areas. What this does is it creates a absolutely lovely transition from your shadowed areas where the dry brush doesn't reach to the highlighted areas where your dry brush is catching and applying the paint. You can do this with multiple colors building up a nice gradient, doing a heavier dry brush for your first layer so that it applies more paint to more of the model and then getting gentler and gentler as you go up in brightness of paint color. The ones that I'm using here are from Artist Opus and they are probably my favorite dry brushes that I have used, but for a beginner, they are probably a little bit on the expensive end of the range. Don't get me wrong, I think they are absolutely fantastic, but for people just getting into the hobby, maybe something on the cheaper end is a little bit more approachable. If you wanted to try that, then using makeup brushes is a fantastic alternative to using these rounded dry brushes. Now that we've got this model to this step, I think it's a good point to talk about varnishing. I like to use varnishing to affect the finish of the paint on the model. There are a few different types of varnish. Generally though, people will be talking about gloss varnish or matte varnish. Now matte varnish is the matte version. It is not shiny, it is not reflective, and it dulls stuff down, generally tends to darken down paint on a model. Gloss varnish does the exact opposite. It makes it glossy and shiny. If you wanted to make something look wet or slimy, gloss varnish is the way to go. Now for this, because I'm gonna be adding some metallics on later on, I'm going to do a matte varnish on this now. The reason that I'm doing that is so that the cloth will look different and have a different finish to the metallics later on. It will help separate them from the metallics once the model is finished. Again, you can get varnishes in different ways. You can get brush on stuff, you can get spray can stuff, and you can get stuff for airbrushes. I prefer using, once again, the Colour Forge stuff. This is a really, really good matte varnish in a rattle can, readily available at many different stores. There'll be links down below if you do want to pick any of the stuff up that I'm talking about in today's video. To use this, it's exactly the same as a primer. Spray it from about 30 centimeters away, short, sharp bursts, and make sure you apply an even coat to the entire model, and you should be good. Once that's on and dry, it's time to start talking about metallic paint. Now, metallic paint is paint that's got little flakes of metal in it, like tiny, tiny little particles of metal. And what it does is it gives it a metallic finish, a shiny finish on your miniature. Now, a nice easy way to get a nice looking metallic finish is to apply a base coat of whatever color metallic you're doing and then apply a wash or a shade to that metallic once it's dried. What this does is it dulls down that first layer of metallic while still leaving the color intact and a little bit of the shine, but also making sure that it doesn't stand out too much from the rest of your model. Once the shade is on and dry, you can go back in either with the same metallic color or a brighter one and pick out the edges of the metallic area. What this does, especially for things like swords or armor, is it adds that extra highlighted detail onto there and makes it look like it's shining on the edge, like the edge of the blade is sharper than the rest of the blade. 
For this, we use something called highlighting, and that can be done in many different ways. It can be done by dry brushing, which we did earlier on, or it can be done specifically and deliberately with a regular brush. To do edge highlighting specifically like we're doing here on the sword, you generally want to apply some paint and then use the side of your brush rather than the tip and drag that along the side, trying not to press on too hard so it doesn't overspill onto the flat of the area that you're painting. With all of that on, the model itself is looking pretty good and I'm pretty happy with how this looks. This took me about 20 minutes to do if I wasn't waiting for drying time and I wasn't missing about filming it with the camera. And I don't think that's too bad, especially for a beginner video. But the model isn't quite finished yet. There is still one thing left to do, and that is to do the base. Now there are plenty of different things out there for basing miniatures, stuff like texture paint, texture paste. You've got all your different things like static grasses and stuff like that. And I personally prefer using the stuff from Geek Gaming Scenics. No, I don't get paid to say that. I just like it because it looks real, because it is real. To do this, all I need to do is apply a thin layer of base ready glue and then pick whichever base ready product I want to use. For this one, I'm using Apache Planes and it's simply a matter of dipping it in the tub, spinning it around a couple of times to make sure it's completely covered and then tapping it off once it's on. Sometimes you might want to mix things up and add something like a tuft as well, just to add a little bit of variety on a base. And generally that is the model done. And that's it, that is Miniature Painting 101. I really hope that this video has been helpful. If you are a veteran or someone that's been doing the hobby for a long time, then maybe it wasn't the video for you, but maybe this can help someone that you know who is wanting to get into the hobby. If you know anyone like that, please share the video with them and hopefully we'll get more people into this fantastic hobby and see more amazing painters coming up and sharing their work online. If you enjoyed the video, leave us a like, comment, share down below. And if you're brand new, then subscribe to keep up to date with all the content coming in the future. If you want to help support the channel, please check out our Patreon, which is linked down below in the description. If you join that, you'll get VIP access on Discord. You'll get access to exclusive extra content on Patreon, as well as other stuff like stickers and miniatures. Other ways to support the channel are by using our affiliate links linked down below in the description, which gives us a kickback every time you buy anything through them, and it doesn't cost you guys anything extra. So the next time you're looking at starting a new hobby project or just picking up some new supplies, use the links below and it helps us massively. That's gonna do it from me. I'll catch you in the next one, and until then, enjoy your hobby.